this way. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine Driscoll from Impact. Um, thank you for coming along this afternoon. Um, and um, a particular thank you to the presenters who are um, going to inform us all afternoon here. Um, from my point of view, this is probably the most important session on the conference program. Um, the solutions that people are going to be talking about here today and the information you're going to hear is um, likely to be something that you need to consider within this decade. Um, so thanks again to the presenters. Uh, I need to stick to a timeline. So um, I'm going to keep an eye on your time and maybe give you a nudge if I need to. I hope I don't need to. Um, we'll have, hopefully we'll have enough time at the end of each session to take some questions from the floor. So please feel free to uh, ask the presenters your questions. Um, if, I think there'll be a microphone roaming. If you have a question, just wait till the mic comes to you because we do have some people online and we all want to hear what your question is. Um, so just tell us where you're from, who you are, when the mic gets to you. So first up, we've got um, Andrew Smith. Andrew's the general manager of Tribe Infrastructure Group. Um, you can see all the bios online, so I'm not going to repeat them here, but I think it's probably fair to say that Andrew is likely to be one of the busiest people in New South Wales at the moment. Um, so I'm sure everyone is very interested to hear from Andrew today about progress in New South Wales. So please welcome Andrew Smith. <coughs> Afternoon. Get my water and figure out how to work that. All right. So we've been working on a few projects from Tribe. I'll just give you a quick background on who we are. A quick introduction is what we're going to do, and then we'll jump on to some old incinerators and some new energy from waste in New South Wales. Tribe Infrastructure is uh, Abu Dhabi based, and we're also based in Sydney. We do over there financial advisory. You see a bit of the pedigree and the project we've worked on, about 30 people over there and we're about three or four here, a small team, developing several projects in Perth, Melbourne and now New South Wales. Um, our main thing out here is just development, we don't do financial advisory but when we're mainly energy from waste. Um, you might know us on the East Rockingham project which we started or got involved in back in 2018, 19. Um, it's nearing completion of construction this year, we hope. It's been delayed and stuff, but it is moving forward. It's a $300,000, you know, 500 million, probably 600 million by the time it ends um, project. We're also working down in Maryvale on the Opal paper, along with, um, that says sewers, but it's actually Violi now, um, next to the Opal paper, providing steam and power to them and taking planned 650,000 tonnes of waste in that machine, which is a good size. Tribe itself is advised only on the bottom ones, the Dubai Energy from Waste Plant, the Abu Dhabi, which has just been awarded to a consortium of um, Hitachi Zosin and Marabeni. That's going to be two 450,000 tonne a year lines, I think, or 420. The Sharjah, which is up and running, we advise the governments on that, and the Little Hazardous Waste Project as well. So we've got a pretty good background on how these things work and the finances and stuff on them and what needs to happen to get one up and running. Um, that's our rocking plant. That's an older photo um, from last year. Just some brief stuff, 300,000 tonnes. It's got the 300,000 tonnes contracted to it, so we're just trying to get the construction completion after a few delays and COVID stuff, etc. Um, that's it just three months ago. The cladding's all on. I think some of the roads have actually gone in now, the way bridges. They've done the commissioning or testing on the boilers, so that's a good step. And they will hopefully get waste first fire into it later this year. The contractor can't give an exact time yet. And I also put that there because that's our architect's render from about four years ago. And it actually looks like it, which is very unusual for an architect's <laughs> render. You can see similar things there. Yeah, I like that. The pool will probably look just like that. You can probably want to swim in it. Not, but anyway, we'll see. It's half done. That's just another view from the back. That big shed on the right is the IBA processing plant, which we are doing on site. Not all of them do that. You can see the size of it. It's going to process about 60,000 tonnes of IBA into road base. And the boilers and stuff there as well. So 
That's the one hopefully getting up this year. That's the Maryvale render. We have not started construction. We're trying to get to end of financial close this year. We're doing an early contract involvement with a couple of firms. Um, to try and it only it's next to a very large paper mill, which needs a lot of steam, which obviously is a very good solution for a wet energy from waste plant. Trying to find steam off-takers in Australia is tricky, but it's increases the efficiency of the plant by double, and you save a lot of greenhouse gases and a lot of a lot of energy going to steam, which is good. So we're working on that. Um, it's coming. Hopefully by the end of this year we'll start construction. Um, now New South Wales. We'll get onto this in a minute. I just thought I'd start with a little bit of a history I came across over the last few years dabbling in this in this um, space that incinerators are not very new to New South Wales. They've been here for a long time. Um, they weren't waste to energy plants, they were incinerators. I just thought I'd throw up a few of these very interesting old slides from Piemont. So that's sitting down there in Piemont. It's gone now. Um, it was a Walter Burley Griffin designed incinerator that belched black smoke out of the... Uh, the stack, it had no off-gas treatment whatsoever, it just burnt the waste. But it ran from 1937 till 1969, which is 30 years of people putting up with incinerators in New South Wales. And it was a, seen as a, you know, a new technology back then. That's the Waterloo, I think people have heard of that. It tried to improve its air emissions in 1971, but it was open as well for 30, 40 years since the 30s. It's now gone, it's Green Square now, if you know Sydney at all. Um, had a very big stack and it had a very bad reputation. And then this one I love. This is anybody here from Sydney City Council or Inner West? Because this one is the bottom there is that prior to construction of the Glebe in the Road in 36, the Glebe Council used to load its garbage onto barges at its depot and forth and towed it out through the heads. <laughs> so this was a great new technology for them. Um, anyway, it opened in 33, closed in 52, all Walter Bully Griffin. He seemed to have a monopoly on the design of all these plants. I don't know why, but they're Art Deco. They look fantastic. That one's in Willoughby. There's another one in Marrickville, and there's one in Ipswich, which is called Walter Bully Griffin. So, so we, before our time, I suppose, most of us, um, ins these incinerators were all around Sydney, Willoughby. You know, that's now the Willoughby Leisure Centre, that one. It's still there. Anyway, on to New South Wales and what's happening with the waste of energy. I put this slide up just showing that the diversion has stuck over the last few years for the uh, municipal solid waste and the CNI putrescible waste. So it's sitting there at 43, 48%. Um, most of that is coming from the gallon green bin. The red bin is 100% you know, landfill. So we've tried MBTs, we've tried the U3R3 process, we've tried those, the Bedsminsters, remember them? There's still a couple going. They, they just don't work. They're closing down. They got a 5% return out of it, plus the 30% moisture loss, so that's where they're sitting. The, we can keep trying, knocking our head on the door, but it's not going to happen. So we're looking at waste to energy to try and get those diversion rates up and get those things going. In the New South Wales, you know, this woman. Those are my numbers. I pulled them from the war data, etc. We've been working on these because obviously we're working on projects in New South Wales. Five million tonnes of landfill of MSW and CNI. Sydney Metro is probably about three million of that. Uh, it's a guess on the CNI. There's not a great deal of numbers available on that. But if you look at that, we've got. 1.43 million, and if I just jump to the next slide, if you see the, the, the amounts, I reckon we've got about 2.5 million tonnes of putrescible going to these two landfills in New South Wales. Um, the numbers of that, Lucas Heights took just under a million. It's over capacity, it keeps reporting the EPA that it's over its licence. And Woodlawn down there, which uh, Catherine will talk on the project down there in a minute, is probably doing about 900,000 tonnes, which about 700 comes from Sydney on the rail. But Lucas Heights is very close to capacity. I think it signed an expansion agreement in 2017 with Southern Shire Council for 8 million extra tonnes to go in. Eight years ago, that is. It had 3 or 4 million tonnes capacity at the time. Take a million a year, do the math. It's full in 28, 29, 30, somewhere there. Um, they are looking to expand it. The Clean Away CEO did say they were actively looking to try and expand it, but that's going to be a tough one for... Government, it's going to prove an expansion on the landfill when it's trying to get landfill diversion going. And is there the space that I don't know, can go higher, it's going to be a very big mountain. So what's going to happen when that happens in 2029? It's not that far away when you consider getting up a new one takes much more than that. Even a waste to energy plan will take longer than that. So what is going to happen? The government has then gone on a waste to energy policy in New South Wales back in 2021. They announced this. Um, due to, I think, background from the Sydney Basin with problems with proposals that came through 
at Eastern Creek, uh, which created, you know, fairly poor social licence sort of efforts, and the government reacted um, and pushed this out, where they said there are going to be four sites available in New South Wales where you can put a waste to energy plant. Um, one of them is Richmond Valley, I guess represented here today. That one, they've suspended that one. It's a very long way north to haul waste and uh, try and get a minimum 300,000 tonnes for a plant in that area. The Mount Pipe Power Station was a project with um, Regroup and Energy Australia, and that was going to be taking the steam off the, power the waste to energy and put it into the power plant. Now, the power plant's scheduled to close by 2034 now as a coal-fired power plant, so that project has ceased and they've ungazetted that site. Energy Australia pulled out. Leaving two, we'll talk about these two in a minute, Southern Gold, which you'll talk about in a minute, down at near Lake George, that's the Veolia's Woodlawn site, and Parks. So, government is running a tender on Parks, we'll talk about that in a minute. It's still under tender, so I can't say too much, but it's sitting out there, and we'll get onto that next. So, those two are left, there are no more. They will review this, I think, in 2025, um, as to whether there should be other sites. Other sites are available, but you have to apply to them. They're on ex-coal mines, there's power plant sites, etc. So none have been gazetted yet. I don't know if anybody's even applying for one, apart from this one. They also banned them in the Sydney metro area, so you cannot put one in that area there. So that goes north to the central coast, down to Bargo in the south and the Blue Mountains. So you will not be able to put one in that area, and that's legislated. So we're stuck with parks and Goulburn at the moment. But the need for them is are going to be well over a million tonnes very soon and probably two and a half million in the near future, up to 30. So we're going to put them out in the country. So that's the one of them there. That's the ARC down in Woodlawn that's proceeding. It's in the approval process at the moment. Catherine will talk a lot more on that in a second. Um, just that we'll point out on that one that they have been railing the, tra the waste down there from two locations in Sydney very, very successfully for 20 years. And the parks project looks like it's going to be very similar to that. So this is one we're involved in it. They're, they're still discussing. They will make an announcement, hopefully, in the near future. Um, but in the meantime, we can't say too much about it. But I'll give you the background on it. So it started quite a few years ago in these special activation precincts where the government decided to put four or five or six special activations. They're basically big industrial sites around the country. One was at Parks. And because that's where the railways meet, the north-south meets the east-west, so it's kind of like a little inland port. And... Um, They've also planned on the left there, it's not all that clear, but they've got waste to energy zones in there, they've got uh, you know, minerals processing, they've got abattoirs, they've got a whole bunch of other activities in that area. Um, they have bought the land, they've done 160 million ducks, bucks of enabling work in roads, sewage, electricity, there's a substation going in. Um, so they're moving on it and they're running a tender for the waste to energy plan out there for three years now, moving to the pointy end of it. Um, they do are planning to, you know, you can be in Brisbane or Melbourne or Sydney in 12, 24 hours on rail, which is why it's there. So when that one finally comes up, hopefully, you know, there's only a couple of us going for it, we'll be able to announce a fair bit more and, you know, what's going to happen. But we're planning intermodal stations in Sydney and putting it on train to parks. It's about a 10-hour haul, so they'll go back and forth hopefully daily and they'll be located around Sydney, very similar to the Woodlawn uh, model, taking it to a landfill. We can answer a question on that later. So I'm just getting on to why we're looking at energy from waste with these landfills in New South Wales. That's a deliberate little picture there of a um, satellite that went up not long ago called geomethane. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, the first one is, we're going to try and get these diversion rates up. These new things that we're working on in Maryvale and uh, Rockingham can divert virtually 100%. Um, we say 99 because, you know, you never know, there might be a tiny little bit that cannot be recycled, but for every 300,000 tonnes in, we will process the bottom ash and get out about 60,000 tonnes. We'll get the 30 megawatts of electricity from the heat. We'll get all the metals out. 90% of the metals will get out. Those too small, we might be getting. And we'll also be able to reprocess the uh, air pollution control residues, they're called, ABCR. So these are toxic. They're mainly lime. They're mainly alkali. They have the activated carbon in them that we used to scrub. Uh, but we can solidify them now in a process um, called carbonation, which will you know, fuse them together and they can go into these concrete sand sandstone blocks. So, so it's a pretty good story and it's getting better and better every year with the new technologies coming on board. Um, so 300,000 on in and we can get rid of the lot, you know, we can reuse everything, plus provide 
quite a bit of electricity. So for parks, you know, that could be 60 megawatts out there, and for one in Maryvale, it'll be about 65. That's why I got the methane little satellite up. We do pump it out CO2, there's no lie about that. That comes out the stack, we'll produce about 165,000 tonnes of it, but the landfills are showing that they will produce more. So we will offset that if it's going into a landfill. That new satellite will show, I think, some pretty interesting stories about what's coming out of landfills around the world when it focuses in on them. That's one in Georgia, USA, and they were surprised how big that plume was, and it's constant. Um, they did focus on one in Rio de Janeiro and one in Mumbai, and it was just off the charts. So if there's no control on it, it's, it's much, much, much worse. Um, we then will offset on the on the electricity grid, uh, 30 megawatts or you know, 240,000 megawatt hours a year, and you take the average, how much CO2 the average grid pumps out, um, we will offset that. Uh, given that when FOGO comes out of landfills, then there will be less you know, methane produced, and as the grid cleans up, the offset will go down, but for now, we are you know, fitting out that we're saving 250,000 odd tonnes of greenhouse gases, which, which is true. So they've got those benefits. It is also a big question that everyone asks, is, oh, will it prevent recycling? And, and, and we say, no, it's not, it's not that recycling can happen. We have developed in Australia on this for the, all of you out there looking at waste or energy for a waste supply agreement. It's called a waste arising contract. Um, some of you may know about it, but basically it just says, we will take your red bin. You don't have to guarantee what's in that bin, yeah, the tonnages. It's just that as long as you've got a red bin collection, we'll get it and whatever's in it. If you deliver it to us with nothing in it, that'd be great if you can get that at that stage, no problem at all. But um, bringing in FOGO, for example, you might get 20% of the organics out of your stream and that will come out of the red bin. We, we're okay with that. We, we just think that's a great incentive and we're not going to stop you with a put-or-pay contract. Um, some of the councils we've spoken to do put a put-or-pay for part of it because you'll get a cheaper rate. Jean-Marie Verrier down there will tell you that the bank's like that. You'll get a slightly better rate. It's not, it's not hundreds of dollars, but yes, it's, it's quite good. Um, so those are the three main advantages I put up there. There are a few others, but uh, you know, in the interest of time and stuff, um, that's it. I hope that updates you. I haven't answered questions. getting to you if you like. I'm interested Hello. in the, um, the APC, A APC residue. Um, is it a solid waste? Yes, it's powder. And, okay, so it's how could... So it's not much, there's not much left in terms of feedstock. Out of 300,000 tonnes, you're looking at a small percentage. Yeah. Are you confident that... Um, you can use it, and if not, is it going to be subject to the levy? Ah. <laughs> no, so we're going to... Uh, yep. So we're engaging Maribel in early stages with a company called OCO, mm -hmm. who um, accelerated carbon treatment. They're treating just under 200,000 tonnes of APCR in UK successfully. They've got off-takers for the limestone blocks. They're all approved by the UK EPA. They're going through the process with the Victorian EPA at the moment to get approval for this. Uh, seems to be going well. It's taking a bit of time, but yeah, so we're hoping, we're, we're confident that'll be ticked off and we can start reusing that, that process. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, hello, um, Sergio Puente from SMIC. Any comment on carbon capture? There's a lot of carbon capture technologies here and you just mentioned everything goes up. Yeah, look, um, when we're, we're, we're looking at that, uh, HZI is one of our partners on the, the project in Rockingham, and all I know is they're running a pilot project in Europe. It's smaller, it's one tonne an hour, but they're looking at carbon capture on the stack. But it's my gut experience is it's very, very expensive. So, and it's not really working, it's not proven yet for the waste to energy plants. So, but Europe's looking at it, yeah. We'll probably look at it more if we've got a bigger landfill levy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, ben Lewis, Melbourne City Council. Um, 
Is the 300,000 tonnage commitment the minimum you need for, for one of these to become viable? Yeah, pretty about that, yeah. Yep. yep. Your, your plans include a stage two? Yeah, the, the, the per, uh, sorry, the Melbourne plan is going to start at 325,000 and then the phase two is 650. So we'll click that off once we get the waste contracts in place. You won't get financing without them in place. So. And Parks is looking like three to 600,000 as well. So phase one, phase two. Anything else from anyone? All right, thank you. Um, please uh, yeah, thank you. Andrew Smith. <laughs> So equally exciting is to hear from our next speaker, um, Catherine Whitfield. Catherine is Veolia's General Manager Business Development and also the Project Manager for the Woodlawn Advanced Energy Recovery Centre. Uh, so this is another very important um, piece of the in infrastructure puzzle for New South Wales um, and I look forward to hearing from you, Catherine. So please welcome Catherine Whitfield. Wonderful. So I think one of the key questions that I've been getting over the last couple of days is how are we tracking uh, with the Woodlawn Advanced Energy Recovery uh, Centre? Um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the Gumbangir of the Gumbangir Nation, um, who are the traditional owners of the lands on which we uh, meet today. And I pay my respects to their elders, past, present and future. So look, I'm sure there's a lot of people in this room uh, who are very across energy from waste, um, what it does, the, the reasons why. Um, Andrew gave us a really good uh, overview of, of some of those reasons and some of the journeys that we've been on uh, with uh, waste to energy in Australia. Um, but I guess I just wanted to, to go back and, and, and recap a little bit on why we're actually interested in energy from waste. And so energy from waste facilities, they're a proven technology and they're used around the world to recover energy from waste materials that otherwise would be disposed of to landfill. And for decades, these energy from waste facilities have been converting waste into heat and electricity by means of combustion. Um, as well as enabling the recycling of the metals and the reuse of the aggregates. And in comparison to landfilling, the great thing about energy from waste is that it also manages the waste immediately, rather than actually leaving it as a legacy issue for future generations to deal with. While they're relatively new in Australia, um, they're proven and widely used overseas, including over 2,000 plants, operating around the world. Now, from Veolia's perspective, we operate around 65 of these facilities worldwide, and we will soon manage Australia's first two energy from waste facilities, the Quinana and the East Rockingham facilities in Western Australia. Um, and I did get a bit of an update uh, from our ops team in relation to the Quinana project. Um, so they're expecting the waste delivery in the next four to six weeks and the first fire of uh, waste shortly uh, after that. So that's a really huge milestone for that project. I know you'll hear a little bit about uh, today in relation to the Woodlawn Art Project. These projects do take time, they take patience, um, but we will get there. Um, in addition, Violi is part of a consortium uh, with Opal Australia Paper and Mazda Tribe Australia, developing the energy from waste facility in Maryvale in uh, the Latrobe Valley in Victoria. And really, finally, getting now to the, the key topic of conversation today, um, which is the development of the Woodlawn uh, Arc facility, um, which is located down at the Woodlawn Eco Precinct. So just to give you a little bit of a, a quick recap of the um, project and, and some of the key stats associated with it. So it's an energy recovery facility with thermal combustion on a moving grate process. And it's being designed to process 380,000 tonnes per annum of waste, which is roughly around a third of the waste that we have coming into the Woodlawn Bioreactor Landfill today. 
In terms of generating capacity, um, it will produce around 30 megawatts of electricity, which to give you an idea, it's the equivalent of powering around 40,000 homes. And once optimised, the facility will be able to provide recovery of up to 96% of all of the waste uh, inputs, and that's through the recovery of the energy, the recovery of metals, and the recovery of aggregates from the incinerator bottom ash. So I think Andrew had this picture up uh, before, um, but just to give you a little bit of an idea of what we've actually uh, got. So at the very centre of the screen, you can see the old mine site. So that's the old mine void um, at the very centre. And you can also see the damage to the land around that uh, mine site. So really key for us on this project is actually rehabilitating uh, this piece of land. Um, in the top right hand corner you can see the uh, Lake George um, and along the ridge line you can also see the uh, wind turbines um, that are on the site. And um, just in the, in the uh, centre there beside the void is the uh, superimposed um, ARC facility uh, which is being co-located next to the landfill. So one of the things that was really important for us on this project was to consider the natural environment um, and to be able to draw inspiration from the design of the surrounding natural landscape. Whenever we were designing it, we were looking at the building orientation, how can we utilize passive heating and passive cooling um, as part of the project design, and the shape and the color um, of the building itself fits in with the topography of the uh, ridge line. Um, of the, and that was really done to limit the visual impact. Um, as well as um, uh, the inclusion of those uh, design properties, we're also looking at using sustainable materials where we can um, and using materials with low embodied energy. So why here, why look at putting this facility at the Woodlawn Eco Precinct? Well, there's really four key, key reasons. Um, the first is the existing land use. So the site already has existing compatible land use, including integrated waste management and resource recovery operations already on site. In addition, we're rehabilitating the mine site. Secondly, the existing infrastructure. So as Andrew touched on, um, having that real infrastructure um, down to the site that's already in place, it's already bringing waste down to the um, Woodlawn uh, Bioreactor landfill today, that is really key. And we've got those current approved rail and road transport infrastructure and licenses. The third one is really around the existing waste supply. So as I mentioned, we're already receiving that residual waste. And ultimately what this project is looking to do is divert waste that otherwise would have gone to the landfill. And it's really offering a better resource recovery opportunity for our council and our uh, commercial customers. And finally, the location. So, Again, this site has been identified through the priority infrastructure area um, to deliver that energy from waste infrastructure for New South Wales, and that's given its location within that southern Goulburn Mulwari precinct. And the site itself will receive waste delivered from Sydney, um, and that will be via our Banks Meadow and our Clyde transfer stations and transported to the site by train. So in addition to the environmental benefits of diverting the waste from landfill, there are clear economic and social benefits that I'd like to touch on as well. Um, the first really being bringing jobs to regional New South Wales. So during construction, we're gonna see the creation of about 300 jobs and during operation around 40 jobs. Um, in addition, there's going to be indirect jobs, uh, which will be through spending with local suppliers during that construction period. And around 70% of the construction workforce uh, will be uh, sourced from the local area. The second is really around boosting that local economy. So there will be around $600 million worth of capital investment to build the ARC. Now, that was whenever we were doing the EIS, the Environmental Impact Statement, and to be honest, I think 
as with all industries, the price of construction um, just keeps going up and up. In addition, there would be around a further $2 billion that would be spent on operations and maintenance over the project life. So community engagement is a really, really critical part of any of these projects, and it's really around taking the community on the journey and the reasons why we're looking at energy recovery. Violi has been part of the community down at Woodlawn for over 20 years, and we pride ourselves on being a valuable contributor to the area. We've got a wide range of community events that we've held over the past two years, um, and to be honest, I mean, honest, pick an engagement technique um, that we haven't tried. I, I genuinely feel like we've, we, we've done it all. We've had in person, we've had online, um, we've had print media, we've had pop-ups. Um, we, we really have tried to um, take on board that feedback from the community and continually adapt our engagement techniques to meet their needs. I look, I won't talk to all of the activities on the screen, there's obviously um, a lot there, but one particular one I did want to call out was we've got a local community liaison committee um, at the Eco Precinct, and one of the things that we did is we've got a reference facility in Staffordshire in the UK. Um, so we actually connected the two uh, CLCs uh, together so that people could actually talk to their peers overseas, talk to them about what were their experiences given the Staffordshire community has an energy from waste <coughs> facility that has been operating for quite a few years. Um, and overall, the feedback from that was overwhelmingly positive. In terms of what we've heard back from the community, and a lot of this has really come back through the submissions to the environmental impact statement, and the top three areas of interest were really around air quality, human health, and traffic. Um, and look, at any energy from waste facility, and I'd say certainly the air quality and the human health piece comes up again and again. In terms of the impact studies that were undertaken for air quality and human health, both noted that there was no or negligible impact um, to human health or air quality. And to help address some of the community concerns that were raised around these topics, we held a series of Meet the Experts events um, so as part of this, we actually had our air quality consultants or human health consultants come talk to community members so they could actually ask their questions directly. Um, and then for traffic, we also assessed the um, impacts both during that construction and operation phases. So I guess the question that everyone's been asking, where to from here? Um, so look, we will lodge the response to submissions formally this year in 2024. And following that, there will be the assessment uh, report that will be developed by Department of Planning. But the ultimate decision for this project it will sit with the Independent Planning Commission. And we're expecting that decision to be made in 2025. As you can see from the timeline on the screen, we're expecting over a 40-month construction and commissioning period. So it's typically sitting somewhere in the three and a half sort of year range at the moment. And the aim is to have the facility operational by 2029 onwards. So if I can leave you with three key takeaways. Um, the first one is just around that importance to adapt to changing circumstances. Over the course of this project, we have had a lockdown, um, so we had to navigate how we uh, engage and communicate with the community during the lockdown period. Um, we also have diverse communities, so again, using a diverse range of engagement techniques and continually evolving and taking on board feedback. I think the crux of it really is let's try and make it easy for people. Let's put information in an easily digestible form. And so part of that, what we did, we, we acknowledged the environmental impact statement. It's a highly technical document. There's a huge number of technical reports that sit behind that. And so we created a community guide, um, which was really breaking it down into simple, easy to understand language. But then you had the QR codes. So you could actually go to the detailed areas of the environmental impact statement that you were most interested in. So if anybody's interested in having a look at one of those, we've got a few at the Veolia stall. 
um, outside, so happy to uh, take one of those away. The second piece was really around understanding the local perspective. So for us, uh, the project is proposed in a regional area, it's an agricultural area, so we're really looking at those key farming concerns. And as part of that, we've developed a series of specialist fact sheets, um, and I've also created a specific agriculture section um, within the response to submission, so people can go straight to that section to really read about the things that matter most to them. Um, and we were also able to leverage Viola's uh, reference facilities in regional areas overseas. And finally, the key takeaway is just around thinking about those tender opportunities, and in particular, joint tender opportunities for councils for your residual waste stream. Um, we don't have approval for the facility yet, um, but once we do, that will be the trigger for the next phase. Assuming approval in 2025, followed by engineering, procurement and construction design phase, we would be looking at procuring waste feedstock through tenders in 2026 to secure a spot. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. My first question, of course, is what's the timeline? So you've covered that. Um, another question I have is, um, whether you have a sort of a transition strategy and how you're going to differentiate um, material going into the bioreactor versus the new facility. Yeah. So, great question, Catherine. Um, today at our Banks Meadow and Clyde transfer stations in Sydney, um, we already separate waste out. So, we separate it into two streams. We separate it into material going into the Woodlawn Bioreactor landfill. And we also separate it into a stream that's going into our MBT, our Mechanical Biological Treatment Facility. So, we're very familiar with that separation process. Essentially, what we'd be doing is adding an additional stream, um, which is for waste feedstock marked for energy recovery. So will you have a criteria, will it municipal material be suitable? Yeah, so look, really, really good question. Again, um, for all of the waste feedstock, it needs to comply with the New South Wales um, Energy from Waste Policy Statement. Um, as part of that, as long as uh, councils are pulling out um, your recyclables and you've got your food organics collection in place, then essentially 100% of that residual feedstock is suitable for energy recovery. And it's very similar for the um, commercial uh, waste as well. Thank you. Questions? Anyone? I'm interested in the community sentiment to um, the technical study saying that it posed um, no to negligible, the air quality posed no to negligible uh, impacts to people's health. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure people wanted to understand what negligible impact to, to health actually meant. Did you refine the comms after that? We, yeah, we did. So that's something that's being refined as part of the response to submissions um, final report um, and essentially talking to our, our consultants and our experts by, by negligible it essentially means zero impact. Um, so yeah, it's again trying to use some of their language. Um, there is uh, yeah, requirements to use certain types of language um, but yeah, essentially zero impact um, and yes, we're doing the refinement. Thanks. Um, Rhys Arde, Lake Macquarie City Council. Earlier you mentioned that it was a two billion operational and capital cost for the project. Was that just to commission or was that the life of the facility? So the two billion dollars is for the operational maintenance costs over the 25 year life of the facility and the upfront capex cost is, well originally it was around 600 million, it's probably crept up now to about 700 million in reality. So is that, so, sorry, is that 2.6 in total or two? So two two billion um, over for the operation and maintenance, and then about six hundred million for the upfront uh, capital cost. Yeah. Last one here. Thank you. Uh, Miles Mason, uh, technical director at SLR. Uh, Catherine, fantastic presentation. Thank you. Really good to see the extent that you've done on the community engagements. Um, I had the pleasure um, or misfortune to be interviewed by the ABC uh, a couple of weeks ago about energy from waste 
One of, one of the um, questions he put to me was, um, you know, well, these naysayers, you know, what, what's, why do they keep saying no? You, you, you say it's all safe. What do you say to the naysayers, Jane Bremer and co, and how do we cut, cut through those people who are always going to say no? And as, as far as you can put facts out there, they're still going to say no. How, how have you dealt with that issue? Look, it's a really good question and it's not an easy one to answer. Um, I think in some instances you've got to just agree to disagree and then there are some people and it doesn't matter how much science and, and how much information you put forward, uh, it doesn't matter the fact that we've done all of our studies from a um, looking at a cumulative worst case scenario um, so to give you one example with the, the human health uh, risk assessment, um, it was done assuming that you're simultaneously swimming in, in Lake George, you're eating the produce 24-7, you're drinking the tank water 24-7, you've got 100% exposure, looking at that from that worst case, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year for 70 years, noting that the facility's lifespan is, is for 25 years, and even under that... It, still completely safe within all of the human health uh, guidelines. Um, so again, all we can really do is just stick to the key messaging um, and, and really try to understand the, the crux of the concerns um, and take on board feedback as we're able to. Thank you. Please thank Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Um, our next presenter is Jean-Marie Verrier from SMBC. Uh, Jean-Marie heads up Renewables and Sustainable Energy Project Finance in Australia. So nothing can happen without this job being done. Um, it's also important to provide context um, to those that will seek the energy from waste services uh, to try and understand the challenges and the risks uh, for getting a project off the ground. You're very welcome, Jean-Marie. Um, and I expect the audience will be very interested to hear from you. Please welcome Jean-Marie. Thank you, Catherine. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. Um, uh, energy from waste is a sector that's very dear to my heart. I worked for about five years on a Queen Anna project four years, worked four or five years on the East Rockingham project, and I've been working on Maryvale for about four years. So as you can tell, uh, it's a sector that um, needs time. I think Veolia mentioned that before, um, but also a sector that's very important uh, to divert uh, from landfill uh, uh, as we go forward, uh, because those, those landfills need to be, um, to be uh, you know, probably exited at one point and or the, the government will actually not permit us to continue them. Um, so the reason I'm actually delighted to be here today is because I work for a bank. I work for Sumitomo Mitsui Banking Corporation. I work for, it's a big Japanese bank. Uh, and there's not a lot of interactions between banks and local councils in particular in Australia or the public sector. Uh, this goes to the fact that in Australia, local councils are not uh, are a third, part, are a third uh, level of government, but that is not completely separated from the state level. Uh, and so a lot of, in some states, in fact, some of local, council, local councils are not actually allowed to, uh, to speak directly to banks. You use uh, finance corporations to borrow money. Uh, in New South Wales, it's slightly different. You can, but it's basically uh, the realm of a couple of major uh, Aussie banks. Uh, and finally, you don't use project finance. So banking, finance, money, um, uh, when it comes to local government, um, is not really utilized in a uh, project finance sense of the term, which is basically created special purpose vehicle to develop projects. So Australia is one of the world leader uh, in public-private partnerships. Uh, I moved to Australia in 2006 because the PPP model uh, was very much... Uh, respected, I mean, Australia was scoring a lot of, very much punching above, the, above its weight uh, in the PPP sector, and you had a multitude of states, in particular Victoria and New South Wales, uh, scoring a lot of points by developing new methods to raise private sector capital from all over the world to build infrastructure in New South Wales and Victoria. And then Perth did it with a stadium, Queensland did it with a bunch of schools and other assets, 
Uh, toll roads were built that way. Uh, I must say those toll roads were built uh, with a, a, massive at, um, a massive level of profits for the state, um, not necessarily for a private sector. Um, and so the way my bank, for example, why are we involved is because we are very involved in project finance, generally speaking. And in Australia, waste, waste to energy is one of those mini sectors that we cover. We do wind, we do solar, we do transmission lines, we do hospitals, we do uh, private schools, etc. Uh, but energy from waste is basically the sector that is not really addressed by state. Uh, and we need to develop this local council level public private partnership style of, of, of financing. So that's basically at the moment pr uh, energy from waste and the way we look at it. So, for me, basically, uh, coming from that pure financial angle, my goal today is to basically share with you the way bankers think. It's really to show you the, the perception of finance, the finance world in general, and how we look at sectors. So for us, basically, we look at energy from waste. It's a subsector of what we need to do. We need to deploy capital, and basically, we need to understand the way local councils work and try to help them and con you know, collaborate with them to, to, to create a method of public-private partnership finance. So basically in the waste hierarchy, energy from waste is the first pillar for a more circular economy. So from the way a, a guy like me thinks, if I want to, uh, to, to crack, to, to basically get more market share in project finance in waste energy, I will need to, um, to, to um, focus on the next cab of the rank, which is energy from waste. This is the most, the priority asset, I think, for local council in the future, because landfills are going to, uh, to be a thing of the past at one point. Um, so I think local councils know that, uh, public organization, you know, uh, think tanks, etc., know that. And so we know that EFW will become an essential municipal service uh, as is landfill and, we, and will help basically get from landfilling to a uh, purer form of recycling in the future. And finally, uh, from a finance point of view, local councils are not just important for us as bankers because of uh, trying to get market share, trying to do deals, etc. It's literally important because the cash flows come from those from those local councils. So if you if you look at the graph on the on the left, this is the way bankers think. So we're not engineers; some of us are, but we we, we look at it from a purely almost uh, you know a mechanical point of view where the money flows. So basically, the energy from waste receives the waste from local councils and waste collectors like Veolia, for example, and CleanAway and others. Um, and then the waste gets treated, and there's three products. Power, which goes to uh, an off-taker or the NEM or the, uh, the pool, a uh, merchant's uh, power market. Metals, it goes to, hopefully, we can find a metals off-taker, uh, trying to recover value from them. And then there's the ash. Uh, so you've got the, the specialist in the room that spoke just before me. Um, about about that, uh, including APCR, which is uh, the f when when we did when we did the first project called Quinana, we could not treat APCR, and now we the third project does right. So th this tells you about this is about over the course of about six seven years, we we went from from not really knowing what we're going to do with it as as bankers as as financiers to having a, a good story to tell to our credit committees before the investment the the loan is approved. Now from a contractual structure point of view. This is how bankers look. So at the center is the project company. That's our borrower. So we want to make sure that that legal entity will be able to pay principal and interest to the loan we're going to provide. Those loans have, uh, are structured to have around uh, 19, 20 year uh, notional tenors. Uh, and so we, we are going to look at the, at the asset from the risk allocation point of view to make sure that that principal and interest are covered with a buffer. Uh, so, of co obviously, we will look at uh, the construction uh, of the asset, the risk associated with construction, the operator. So, Veolia is currently the heavily, uh, the clear leader in that space because they're they're basically the ONM contractor for all three projects that are likely to to close to um, to complete the, the, the quickest. <coughs> um, and on the other side, obviously, we've got uh, we need to find a, a power purchaser. We need to find local councils and uh, waste collectors to sign a waste supply agreement, uh, uh, which, which means paying a gate fee, uh, and obviously trying, hopefully, to find uh, ash and metals disposal agreements. 
So project finance, which is uh, my job, uh, which is, uh, so it's not like corporate finance uh, or, uh, so when, when we lend money, we do not have a guarantee from the, from the parent company of the legal entities that are involved. So when, when we lend money to Queen Anna, East Rockingham, Marivelle, we do not have a guarantee from Veolia or Mazdar or all these uh, corporate, you know, these big uh, companies. We only rely on the cash flows generated by that particular waste energy project, right? So, because it's important to mention that because some people are sometimes confused and assume that bankers rely on, on some corporate support. We, we don't have that. It's called non-recourse finance or project finance. And project finance is the art of, of allocating risks to the counterparty base capable of handling them. Um, so, you know, the box in the middle is what I do. So we build a financial model. Uh, so we, we create a debt sizing strategy and we help the, our customers when we do advisory uh, job to uh, maximize the internal rate of return of their equity injection. So how do we build that financial model? Well, it's by looking at those uh, five boxes or by five circles around it. The first, clearly the most important one to uh, develop a waste energy project is the waste supply agreement story. So waste supply agreement story is basically who, who is gonna provide the waste. It's often a combination of local councils and, uh, and waste uh, aggregators, waste um, collectors. Uh, uh, and basically we look at the waste arising versus the put or pay model. Uh, the the put or pay model is when the, cons the council or the OLEA or clean away offer a fixed volume, a guaranteed fixed volume of waste every year at a certain gate fee. The waste arising model is when the local council uh, provides uh, a monopoly on their red beans, so all their red beans will go to the uh, waste energy project against, uh, against an, a gate fee, but they do not have to guarantee the volume, so they can, for example, uh, go through a FOGO uh, reform where the red bean volume is decreased a little bit and the waste energy project agrees to take that risk. Um, participants agreement, big issue in local council land in Australia. Basically, um, a lot of, for, for project uh, developers, it's hard to get to that 300,000 uh, ton per annum minimum tonnage that you need to develop the project because you need to go to a multitude of councils. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot of mini uh, suppliers. So you get this council at 15,000 ton per annum, that other at 66, that other at 77, that other at 12. You, in order to get to the 300, it, it takes a lot of time. So the best way to do that, and the way actually Queen Anna and East Rockingham did that, is by finding a regional council that was aggregating the volumes for them in a way. That was not the reason the regional councils were created, but it, it was quite convenient that they existed. Um, and in fact, uh, in Victoria, you, you probably have heard that there's a similar process where a bunch of councils have uh, put together a, a tender as well for waste to energy. So aggregating those, uh, those councils is important, but from a lender's point of view, there's a credit risk associated with the council. So we need participants agreement when a regional council signs a waste supply agreement to waste energy. There's a, in fact participant agreement behind the scenes uh, to make sure that if one council falls away or is aggregated, etc., or doesn't want to play ball anymore, the others can basically fill up the gap and replace them in the, in the story. So that's, that's a very important um, um, thing to prepare in advance before a project, before a waste energy project can be developed. Um, and then there's other, there's other yeah, items like the tr what, what is called a tripartite and the lender step in right, which is a, um, which is a legal document by which uh, lenders uh, sign, uh, it's called a tripartite because there's three parties to the contract, the local council, the waste, uh, the, the, the waste project, the waste to energy project, and the lenders to the waste to energy project. And the reason why we need that is not to annoy the local councils, which are often quite reluctant to sign a document. Uh, they, they often say, why do, we need to, why do the banks need to be involved here? It should be bilateral, it should be between us, the council, and the, and the plant. Uh, and the reason lenders do that, need that, is because you have situations, unfortunately, in life where the uh, equity of a project needs to be written off, um, but the lenders, they do not want to shut down the project when that happens. So the lenders want to be able to continue to operate the project 
even if the equity has been written off, and we need those tripartites, and it's quite important for the councils to have those tripartites as well. It's not that annoying, in fact, it's quite protective of the council's interest because you know that there's a second line of defense. The bankers are fully interested in, in preserving the existence of that project going forward. Um, the power purchase agreement is, of course, very important. Uh, local councils will not be involved in that most of the time, although in uh, East Rockingham, I think we have a local council that signed a very, very small uh, volume of power purchase. Uh, but that's for the developers uh, to, to sort out, find an off-taker for as long as possible uh, to make the project as bankable as possible or, or uh, to make the margin of the project as competitive as possible and the gearing, the, the amount of money you can borrow, as high as possible. Um, then the ash disposal agreement, this is where you, the banks will, will offer various solutions. They will tell the, the private sector, the sponsors, well, if you find me a great story, I will bank against that revenue line. So if it's uh, very credible, you know, if you can sell the ash to a, a cement producer or a road builder um, over five, ten years, I will lend money against that. But if you're just saying, well, I think I will find someone for the ash, I think I will find uh, another solution, then we may not be able to land against that revenue line, but that revenue will be upside for the, for the equity uh, if we can't find a, a decent uh, long-term agreement. <coughs> EPC contract is, of course, crucial. You want to work with, uh, with the A-team, you want to work with some uh, legal entities and, and uh, construction companies that have done this before, that know what they're doing. Uh, in Australia, uh, construction, uh, I always say that Australia, wh what are the biggest risks in Australia? It's construction, construction, construction. So Australia is a, a very famous for construction risks materializing more than in other countries. I've worked in, I've worked in project finance in Europe, in North America, in Latin America, in Asia, and in Australia. I've never seen as many cost of run and delays and in this country in my career. Um, doesn't mean the project go wrong, doesn't mean they, they, they collapse or anything like that, but you have to be ready for, for delays and various issues. And during COVID, as was mentioned before, this really materialized in West Australia, which is a state that decided to shut down its border, which blocked a lot of resources uh, to go from uh, one state to the other. Um, when it's, of course, waste to energy is not just a construction task, it's a technology. You, you bring machines from overseas that you assemble on site. Uh, if some of those components or parts are, are delayed in a, or stuck in a boat uh, somewhere um, during a supply chain uh, crisis like we went through uh, during COVID, and if on top of that your politicians shut down the border, you will run into delays, uh, that's, that's for sure. Um, the the O and M agreement very important bit uh, of the of the puzzle. Um, of course, you need an operator. Th those assets are built to last 30, 40 years. Um, they, they they are very proven technologies. Of, they, it's, there's no doubt about that. This is not, and and I'm talking about moving great incineration here. I'm not talking about any innovation. I'm talking about the traditional waste energy uh, technology, which is probably the in Australia, I would say the, the only one that is uh, bankable for a project finance uh, international group of banks. Um, but you still need, even though it's proven, even though we know what it does and, and we've seen it and we've banked it before everywhere in Europe or in Japan, uh, we, we need to have a very solid o &M operator to make this work because you need to, to make sure that the asset will, will actually resist uh, the test of time, uh, wear and tear, and will last those 30 years that the equity case uh, was built upon. So actually, that's, that's actually the, the ideal. What is the ideal? Sometimes people ask me this. What is your dream deal? What is the ideal risk allocation from a lender's point of view? This is, I just want to plan that. You, you, it's very hard to get this. So number one, you get a long-term put-or-pay waste supply agreement for the full capacity of wa your waste to energy. So let's say a 20-year, 15, 20-year waste supply agreement. That's very hard for local councils to provide, and in particular, guarantee a, a waste volume. That's almost impossible. But this is what is going to get you the cheapest cost of debt, right? The second thing is a long-term take-or-pay power purchase agreement for the full capacity. That's easier to get in Australia. We're getting that on Marivelle. Uh, then you, you um, want a fixed price, date certain, turnkey EPC contract. That should be easy to get, but it's becoming challenging lately, um, which means you, you are, you, you, when you sign the contract with your builder, 
the, you, the price is fixed, there's a deadline that's set in stone, and if it's missed, uh, the builder will pay liquidated damages. And turnkey uh, refers to the uh, asset quality, so the performance level, so you, you, you know that each performance threshold will be met at completion. Otherwise, there will be also liquidated damages payable by the EPC contractor. Um, the fourth is a long-term fixed price o &M. That's relatively easy to get still. Thank you, Violia, for that. Um, I, I hope you, 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 you're still there. Um, and then the, the final one is the revenue generating long-term ash disposal agreement. That's very hard. Well, that's, that's harder to get in Australia than in uh, the UK or France or Italy or, or, or uh, Japan. So th this is about finding a, a revenue generating contract, so uh, finding a market for those, uh, for those products. And in Australia, we're still trying to invent that in a way, but we're, we're getting there. I'm not going to go through that because it's very similar to what I just said, but I'll, I'll just go to the government support box at the bottom. Um, the, in Australia, there is no uh, obligation put to local councils to uh, divert from landfill. There is some uh, warm and fuzzy, um, you know, declaration uh, that uh, it will be done, there's intentions, there's some caps on the number of tonne per annum that should be allocated to waste energy in Victoria, and, the, and then people are all pushing in the same direction, but in the UK, for example, you must divert from landfill, otherwise you will pay a penalty. And of course, when you, when you set it up like that, you drive much, a much quicker investment, which is why uh, the UK is the, has been the pioneer in waste to energy, because there was much more uh, pressure, a financial pressure, to, to all the, the people using landfill to divert as soon as possible. So, gov so we're, we're not getting that, but there's other things that the government can, can do. So a waste, a long-term waste management strategy to uh, inform the market. This is about educating everybody. In this, is, this is this conference, for example. Um, economic incentives, finally we're getting there, at least recently, uh, Western Australia and Victoria landfill levies. So they're being, they're being uh, increased. Uh, that should drive some further investment in EFW. Uh, planning pathways. I'm not an expert about that topic, but I know it's a big, it's a big issue. And then, of course, you need government to help with planning. Um, grid connection, same thing. You need those power plants to be connected to the grid. Uh, that, that's important for the lenders because you want to know that after the end of the power purchase agreement, which is sometimes 10 years, 15 years, but not 20, 25 years, you need to make sure that you will be able to sell the power in the grid um, after those PPAs expire. Um, waste supply agreements is a form, in fact, signing a waste, so the, the mere decision of signing a waste supply agreement is a form of government support. So we have some pioneering lo local councils that don't do it just because landfills are going up, they do it because they, they also have a, a strong political uh, desire to actually divert from landfill. <coughs> and then finally, this is done well in Australia, the concessional finance model, where you have bodies like the MMI or the which um, uh, Mazda is uh, and, and Violi are benefiting from on Marivelle, CFC and Arena have been helping uh, with the waste to energy sector <coughs> at all level of the capital chains. <coughs> so they've been uh, MMI has been providing pure grants, Arena has been providing grants or recover recoupable grants, and CFC has been providing senior debt and uh, sub debt to the sector, which is frankly very uh, impressive, and without those three, none of, none of these three projects would exist, right? Quinana, uh, East Rockingham, and uh, Marivelle. So very quickly, um, where's the value for project developers and their lenders? There is a symbiotic relationship between sponsors or equity and debt. Uh, so getting the best value for the waste, traditional take or pay is the dream of lenders uh, but the sponsors, uh, sometimes, which are directly talking to local councils, tell us, well, yeah, we, you won't get a fixed volume guarantee by that council, but what if, what if we push the waste arising concept for a different gate fee? Can you bank that? And then the question for lenders becomes, is there a volume floor or not in that waste arising contract? Because we, that's the subtlety about waste arising. We, we can find a, a, a way to uh, mix in the middle uh, by, by creating a, a, a floor in the waste rising uh, structure. Uh, and finally, there's the waste aggregators contract model, which is basically, uh, and the same similarly to the, the comment I made about MMI, CFC, and, um, 
and uh, Arena, uh, none of the three projects would have been done without the waste aggregators uh, contract model. So Suez Violia and, and Suez Violia Violia, and then now Violia Violia Violia. <laughs> uh, has been uh, uh, involved in providing that anchor contract, without which, frankly, none of these projects would have existed either. So it's, uh, it's really, uh, as you can tell, there's, it's a bit of a puzzle we're building, and each, each piece of the puzzle really counts. You, can't, you, you need all of them to, to fall into place. And that's why it takes so long to close those projects. And finally, this is an important point, the merchant waste. You have to understand that all these equity guys and the bank guys when we sign the, uh, the, the, the financial documents, most of the time recently, or on those three projects, the waste is not fully contracted. So there is a bet that's being made, and people are investing the money and, be, and starting to pay the invoices of the construction companies without uh, the full capacity being fully contracted. So this is where, obviously, the, um, the, uh, we hope that local councils will realize that there is still some spare capacity in those projects, uh, and, but it will fill up quite quickly because, of course, the equity and, and the debt is very impatient for that, those projects to be fully contracted. So the first, first, in, first in will be served on, those, uh, on the remaining capacity that's not yet contracted through WSAs. Um, getting the best value for electricity, that's obvious. You want to maximize the price you're getting for the power you're generating, the steam you're generating in, when it's an industrial project like the Opal uh, project in Marivelle, um, uh, and of course the uh, large scale certificates that you may extract. Uh, finally, getting the best value from EPC and O&M, well, you need to run competitive tenders to extract the best price possible from EPC and O&M. That's, that's obvious, not always easy because you don't find that you don't always find a lot of EPC contractors ready to bid in Australia, and you don't find a lot of ONM operators capable of operating in Australia. This is my last slide. Sorry, I'm, uh, I know I'm a bit late. Uh, where's the value for local councils? Well, it's very simple, uh, and it's been mentioned before. Uh, e EFW provides global warming avoidance by diverting from landfill. Um, so this is not just important in the sense that um, you, know, you want to make a political decision to avoid global warming. It's also important because right now, there's a nice window of opportunity where you have trillions of dollars available to finance ESG projects in Australia as well because it's an OECD market and a very attractive one. So you've got sovereign funds like Mazdar, you've got Australian super funds, foreign retirement funds, infra funds, and all those traditional banks, including from Japan or France or whatever, Germany. Uh, ready to go, so projects are ready to be financed, and of course when there's a bit of uh, oversupply of funds, that's also going to get you some nice margins and some nice uh, cheap capital uh, to, to get them financed, so now is the time to do it. So surfing the ASG wave is not a stupid idea. Uh, the second, of, you, of course, is more physical and more uh, matter of fact, uh, landfill sites are getting full, uh, and some of them will not be permitted to extend their life. So we'll be you know, anticipating and future-proofing your waste, uh, waste treatment obligation as a local council is, is not a bad idea at all. And finally, um, thank you for your patience. Um, you, you look at, the, this is now, this is, the, this, this is the slide I've been dreaming of showing my credit committee for five years because I've been telling them the landfill levy will go up, we should commit to that sector. This is about five, six years ago I was telling them that story. Finally, it's becoming true. So you've got that $70 per ton is going to 88 in 2025, in June 2025. That's a 28, that's a 25% increase. Uh, and in Victoria last week, that 129.27 is going to 167.9. That's a 30% increase in that. that it, it's actually an operating expense for, for a local council. So having a 30% increase in the cost is uh, something that anyone whether public or private should, should worry about. Thank you. Um, we'll hold over any extra questions um, till the end um, after our next presenter. But I just have one quick question because we have a lot of local councils in the room. Um, with your side finance agreement, are you going to insist on every council that sends material to a facility to enter into one of those or maybe just the foundational councils? 
Um, it's a great question. Um, the answer is generally, when you ask this kind of question to a banker, he's going to say, yes, everyone needs to sign them. So, um, but uh, the, the import, it, it depends, the reason it depends is it depends of the way the, the arrangement works for who replaces who, so the landman standing provision. So if, if there is a good last man standing provision, we, we may be able to rely only on the uh, head, the regional council, and only one signatory to, the, to that document. Um, but the, again, again it, it will only work if that land, last man standing uh, clause is in there. Our last presenter, and I'm sorry, we are a little bit pressed for time now. Um, Eric Spikevik, have I got that right? Uh, this is really testing my Aussie accent <laughs> today. Um, so Eric joins us today from uh, Dutch Power Group, and Eric is the manager of sales and is very well placed to provide a presentation in this session and to explain projects such as the Eco Park in Colombia in managing residual waste. We're also sort of interested to consider the alternative scale solutions um, as well as the integration of various waste stream management. So please welcome Eric. All right, thank you very much. Um, is it, is it something what bankers always do, making things more difficult than it should be? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Thank you, Catherine. Um, thank you also, Waste Conference, uh, for having, uh, having me. I'm uh, yeah, Erik Spijkervet, you almost got it. And I'm from the Netherlands, all the way over from Amsterdam. And I'm here today to talk, talk about small, decentralized and modular waste to energy solutions. So, I've been here since the week before on Monday. I don't know how you say that well in English, but uh, for almost 12 days now. And um, I've spoken to several state council and, and companies. And I think we can uh, agree on that we have a waste issue in Australia. So I won't be getting too much into that. Um, you also are quite acquainted with the targets you've set for yourself, which are, I think, quite ambitious as well. And um, to be able to meet those targets, I think there should be a redefinition of your waste management system. And that's something you've been working on already. Exporting of plastics is already banned. Now you're looking into stopping the conventional landfilling and uh, because we all know what the impact is on the environment of that. So what's next? And I think there has been some talks already about this, that we are going to a circular economy. And one of the characteristics, Johan Prummel from the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and uh, Water Management already told us to this morning, is that when we're going into a circular economy, then waste becomes something else as a uh, something we need to manage but it becomes a uh, indicator of how circular our economy is and i think the latter is something we need to uh, address and to need to think about how we can incorporate this uncertainty into waste management and into waste of energy Also a quote of Martin Luther King. I don't know if you were in the session, session of Joan this morning. He all, also had a quote of uh, this, uh, of Martin Luther King. Um, this is uh, the, yeah, this is our motto from the Dutch Power Group. This is something our CEO uh, yeah, uh, lives and breathes by. And the time is always right to do what is right. And I think we have a, uh, something that, um, yeah, um, I must say it's something we, we operate by on a daily basis. So let's get into a bit of a, uh, yeah, let's get a bit, let's get into the circularity uh, a challenge we have. Um, let's see. I think when we are move, we are moving into uh, to into the uh, circular economy and um, be. be we are not there yet, and we still have some technical and economic 
uh, visibility issues on this. And um, we're not there, so it's not a 100% yet. So to get to the uh, circular economy, we uh, have the, we need to make sure that waste of energy becomes a part of the journey going into the circular economy. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is the small decentralized modular solutions that will uh, that that we see as a better fit to the journey. So first. This is basically the first question I want to address. Should we go for the mass burn solutions that has been pre presented by Andrew, um, or shall we do something else? So first, some things about the mass burn plans. Moving into a circular economy and becoming more circular, we know that our waste volume probably is going to decrease. And that is something that may be an issue for the lifespan of the mass burn plants. Because we need to feed the beast. There are la large operating thresholds, large quantities that need to be put in. I've heard over 300,000 tons, even more. So to maintain that operational level, yeah, you need to acquire enough waste. And I think that's useful in dense areas. But we're in Australia. No? Density is not one of your best characteristics and properties. <laughs> so we need to increase logistics. And on the bottom line efficiency the will decrease if you increase your, if it's, uh, your logistics. So that's one side. So the other side is the small modular, decentralized modular waste to energy solution. And I want to highlight some of the characteristics of this technology. And the first one is that it's a flexible, modular, and scalable solution. And flexible means that we can engineer it to make it fit for purpose. Modular means that it's based on container-sized elements, which we can install on-site. We transport it from A to B by boat, by, uh, by uh, uh, levy, uh, sorry, no, uh, by a uh, truck, sorry. And um, also we can interchange one of the modules when the, whether or not uh, maintenance is required. And scalable, because the size, which is uh, something I'm going to address next, um, makes, and also the volume, which is also I'm something I'm going to address thereafter, um, is that uh, the size of it makes it more easy to scale, scale up and scale down as well moving along with the required volume to be managed. So space, very short. This side, this side, the side requirements are about an acre for the plant itself and an acre for the logistics surrounding the plant. Operating thresholds, okay, hold your horses, oh no, hold your chair, don't fall over. We need only 50,000 tons a year. So that's a quite different difference with the large scale uh, mass burn plants we've been talking about so far. Um, and also meaning that we need less logistics into, uh, 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 we need less logistics to acquire the amounts of waste, which is a nice thing when you're scattered all around the country. And um, also relatively speaking, to start a plan, the investment is uh, from a, is, is a different uh, amount than for the larger plans we've been talking about. And probably uh, Jean-Marie will be happy about it because the risks are also, also lower. Um, and then last but not least is of course the environmental compliance. We've already addressed that topic a little bit. The solution that we want to implement and what that we engineer are is compliant to the World Bank standards and um, it's based on modern technology uh, which also means that continuously monitoring of the emissions is uh, something that we incorporate in our uh, in our solution um, but something else we've been talking about quite a lot the past few past weeks is the social license of a certain plant and it's something we need to address, really. Um, the, the pollution, whether or not it's polluting, whether or not it's health risks, uh, etc. And I don't know who it was, but somebody had a question on how can we address this to the naysayers. And maybe we should 
uh, ask them if they want to be, still want to be, if they want to be environmental imperialists. Do we want to move our emission outside of our comfort zone, or do we want to embrace it and make a local, create a local solution for the local problem we uh, we have? Moving next, we have two designs, two different technologies. We've been talking a little bit about the moving grade. So that's one of the technology. The other one that we, op we, that we uh, design is fluidized bed. And it's basically uh, a difference in particle size. And um, also, there are slight differences in operating these systems. Um, I can tell, t talk a little bit more about that after the presentation if you come by. So, I'm sorry. <laughs> exactly. Thank you. <laughs> so, why is it a good fit? Um, that's what I want to elaborate finally. And uh, first of all, I think we can state that the necessity of waste to energy is a fact. This, these figures are from the National Waste Report of, uh, last of, of 2022. And what we can see is that um, eventually our waste generation is going upwards. The recycling rates are far from the target. Um, so the circular economy indicator is also not... Uh, oh sorry, uh, what we can see is that we have a lot of residual waste because of the uh, circular... In no. I don't know what I wanted to talk about here. Sorry. <laughs> um, no, ne nevertheless, I think we all know that something has to be done, and that's something that we, that we have been talking about a lot already. Mostly geographical properties, and not that much the demographic, but it's still on the slide. I'm sorry about that. But it's mostly the geographical properties of Australia, and also increased recycling uh, uh, rates that uh, makes the smaller decentralized and modular uh, solution, I think, a better fit to most of the areas of Australia uh, than the larger uh, plants. So I think that's, uh, that's why it's a good fit. Um, second, I think the modularity and the flexibility of our technology is also, uh, makes it also a good fit uh, because we can, m can design the plant and, and combine the different uh, technologies in such a way that we can uh, create the best fit for your waste challenge you have at your location. And also, the flexibility, if one of the, uh, um, one of the problems has been solved, we basically can take the plant, re, uh, take it to another place and uh, use it there again. And finally, I think uh, also this, this uh, modularity and also this flexibility in, in our plant makes it also a technology that we can tailor to every state's uh, particular needs. And as we can see here, there are still some, um, yeah, some, some uh, goals to, uh, to uh, the, the goal of 80% uh, is, is still not met. So in, I think in every state there's still a need for a solution. Um, well, yeah, and I think we're, uh, we're happy to provide that. So lastly, short about uh, the Dutch Power Group. Uh, we're a small uh, startup, scaled up from the Netherlands. Um, all the technology that we use is proven technology, but uh, up till now into, in, in other industries. Um, and I think the most important part of our technology, which is the uh, boiler, uh, is operational in Austria uh, next to a, um, a wood processing plant. Um, so, and together with, uh, with the people that are uh, connected to the Dutch Power Group, we have a lot of experience into the waste uh, management sector, waste to energy sector. And how can we help you? In different steps. First of all, we can help you with providing a solution to the challenge you have by consultancy services. We do project development, feasibility studies business case development and others to make sure you have a viable project. Um, we can help you with finding financiers. Or, um, we do engineering in-house and engineering with our partners. We are also contracting, so what you get is a turnkey uh, plant that we put at your location. And then the final step is that we educate you and your local staff to hand over the plant 
to make it a part of the local communi community so you can operate and yourselves have the benefits also from it. Um, yeah, that was my last slide. I'm sorry uh, that I was a little bit uh, not finding the correct words in English, but yeah, <laughs> thank you for your attention. open up the floor to questions to any of the um, um, presenters um, this afternoon, so just raise your hand if you have a question. Um, one question I have for you, Eric, is for a small modular unit, um, if energy is your output, yeah. what do you do with it? If you're in a modular uh, unit, um, do you use batteries, do you need a grid? Yeah, how, it, how it's dependent it? on, on what what the client is, what the location is, where you want to put this, uh, the, the waste of energy plant. If you put it into an industrial complex, you can redirect your energy directly to industrial off-takers. Mm -hmm. um, if it's in a residential area, there's also a need of electricity. You can uh, indeed think about batteries to uh, yeah, uh, um, create a buffer for um, the, the, the differences in, in, in requirement of energy. Um, so yeah, there, there's a lot of end solutions you can fit this into. Right. And also for the steam generation, there, is also different, there are different possibilities to uh, provide a solution for that because you can use heat, in, for, uh, heat for cooling, you can use heat for uh, sweet water production, so it's all kind of possibilities. Okay, thank you. Any questions from anyone else? Everyone wanting to get to afternoon tea, I take yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> all right, well, thank you. Thank you, Eric, and yep. thank you to all the presenters. Um, please. <laughs>